Diabetes is a common disease which is being determined by both genes and environmental factors. We know a few of those genes, we know some of those environmental factors, but we don't know the whole picture. Here in, at the Ben-Gurion University of the Negev, we have a unique uh, opportunity to study both genes and uh, some environmental factors that are involved with diabetes. This is because here in the Negev we have a mix of population which is uh, very unique uh, even uh, in Israel. Uh, we have Israeli born, we have new immigrants uh, from Russia, Ethiopia, etc. And we have the Bedouins and this is uh, an Arab isolate, highly traditional where intermarriage is very uh, common. The fact that the Soroka University Medical Center is the only hospital to this region help us in recruiting all patients and identifying all cases so we can be sure that we have all the uh, diabetic cases both in adults and children that uh, occur in this region. We at the Genetic Institute of the Soroka University Medical Center and the Mungunia University of the Negev have studied for years genetic disorders among the Bedouins. So far we have mapped uh, almost 15 new genes that are involved with various disease phenotypes in this population. Recently we have started some new uh, research projects with the aim to identify uh, genes that are causing common diseases, mainly obesity and diabetes. Here in the Bedouin population we have identified uh, one unique tribe um, where diabetes and obesity are segregating, not necessarily together. So we think that we have here an opportunity to identify genes that are both involved with uh, body mass, with increased weight and diabetes. And we are now starting in uh, collecting data as well as DNA samples with the goal of identifying one or few genes that are associated with diabetes. For one, as a clinician, it's an exciting and fascinating place to work because we've got an admixture of, of just about everything. Every culture, every ethnic group is represented in our patient population. And each group brings with it a specific clinical problem, a specific aspect of disease that needs to be directly addressed with a specific answer. So we have to tailor, we're basically tailors. We have to tailor our, our clinical practice to each one of these different varieties of, of and faces and colors and cultures, which makes it fascinating. for uh, Mr. High Greenhill to decide and donate mine for a, for a chair in diabetes research and education. And he told that the story of his l late wife was a diabetic patient. And uh, she didn't know how to inject herself insulin, insulin shots. And when uh, they went to the doctor, he said, well, you, you take an orange and uh, try to, uh, to give a shot to the orange. And it's about the same like uh, giving the shot yourself. And uh, Mr. Greenhoff and his family, they felt that uh, something uh, must be done to improve uh, patient education. And that was a time where patient education was uh, in a raising interest among the medical community but didn't get very much uh, in Israel, it was much more developed in the United States and England probably uh, one of the first places where they put most, much more emphasis in, in patient education. So for that reason uh, we, we received the money for uh, developing a, a center 
for patient education, diabetes patient education, and uh, and we started from scratch. First, we are uh, we are in the periphery of the country. We are at the newest medical school that opened up in 1974. Um, we had the the lowest socioeconomic class population in the country, the largest proportion of new immigrants coming from everywhere. And with the diabetes being a problem as much as somewhere else, uh, but uh, mainly because of this, um, this mix of uh, cultures and the difficulties in the healthcare system in the area, that was a good place to start developing a new program for diabetes education. I am um, being a physician interesting in, in, interested in type 2 diabetes and considering the point that the Negev is a kind of, not, I would say, wide territory and the population is distributed in small towns and because we have just one center, the tertiary care center, which is our, our center here in Bersheva. And the patients coming from far away, they have problems coming and arriving to the clinic and attending the clinic. And being diabetes, a chronic disorder that needs continuous treatment and follow-up. We have, uh, we have um, conceived, I would say, a new model of diabetes treatment. And that is what we call the mobile diabetes clinic. And we applied that model to the Western Negev, which is the area, it's a kind of triangle from Beersheba towards the, towards the West. On the, on the other hand, being uh, interested in metabolism, I have um, noticed that our Bedouin population here, that they are Muslims, they, they, uh, they fast during one month every year, what is called the Ramadan month. And I was very puzzled, I intrigued, to, I wanted to know what is this month of fasting doing to the metabolism of the patients, to, if they are diabetics? Uh, even more, because as you know, we have 500 or even probably more million of, of Muslims around the world. Uh, but anyway, so it was one Jew that decided to study the whole thing. It was a kind of paradox. And we, we find out very interesting things. One of those is that the, the good cholesterol, you know, the HDL cholesterol, that everybody is so eager to put it up, to rise. And it's very hardly possible to do with medications or with other, other, other means. We find out that if you fast during the Ramadan month, meaning that you eat just one meal during the evening and almost nothing during the day, your HDL cholesterol rises by 25%, which is amazing. And then we went to see what happens with the diabetic patients during the Ramadan. Uh, what they do, they, instead of taking the pills during the day, they took all the pills during the night, okay? In the evening, towards the night, because they are allowed to eat, so they do not become hypoglycemic, so no problem with that. But the, the hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker for diabetes control, went down fantastically, something like 1.5% in one month, which is very hard to achieve in, a, in other ways. Uh, and then again, that was amazing and surprising because any, any book, any textbook you read, they say that they recommend a diabetic patient to have four, six meals a day. And these guys, they have just one, or one and something like that. Just last month, I visited a company in uh, Lyon, which is uh, belong to the Mer to Merck. And this company, who is a drug company which are interested in developing new modalities for the treatment of diabetes, and they arrange one day meeting for uh, their uh, research and development department with four scientists from all over the world, from the stage, England, Germany, and me, and to consider the possibility of develop a new a antioxidant or antioxidant cocktail for the treatment of diabetic complication, including insulin resistant. So it was a day of in which 
each one of us gave a lecture and then we discussed the possibility and I really hope that they are going to do it because I really believe that uh, we will be able in the future to treat and prevent the appearance of diabetes by antioxidants. Our group has uh, been uh, focused in the last years in the uh, research of insulin-dependent diabetes, but mostly on the complications of insulin-dependent diabetes, which is nephropathy. This is the most important uh, complications involving uh, long-standing diabetes, and it actually is the main reason for growing numbers of dialysis patients in the United States and all over the developed world. And uh, we are, uh, have uh, uh, opted to use an animal model of diabetes, uh, of insulin-dependent diabetes, which is the NOD mice. These are mice that were found to develop uh, spontaneous diabetes secondary to an autoimmune attack of the pancreas. And we first of all found that these mice actually develop a kidney disease which is very similar to the disease found in, in uh, human uh, beings. These kidneys, even though the diabetic patients may sometimes lose weight and do not feel very well, the kidneys very rapidly grow, grow. Soon after the development of diabetes, the kidneys grow irrespective of the body weight. And uh, this was the first finding that we found in these uh, mice, was that these uh, animals actually do have a significant growth of the kidney tissue after the onset of uh, spontaneous diabetes. And since uh, uh, we thought that there may be a relationship between this growth and subsequent uh, complications, we uh, first of all decided to look at uh, different mediators of growth in these uh, kidneys. And the most important mediator that uh, activates growth in, a, in, a, in, bi in biology is uh, bi growth of tissues uh, is a growth hormone. And another, now the second observation that we were able to make is that this hypertrophy, this growth of the kidneys was mediated by an increase in the kidney IGF-1 uh, content. The third step would be to try to modulate these changes on the growth hormone and IGF-1 uh, system in the kidney and trying to see whether we can reverse uh, these changes. And, and we have used uh, several interventions for that, uh, trying to block the uh, effects of growth hormone and IGF-1 on the kidney. And we have actually found on uh, two separate experiments using two uh, different uh, materials uh, what that may have uh, potential uh, therapeutic implications can be reversed by the uh, application administration of those uh, blockers of the growth hormone and IGF-1 system to these uh, animals. We are working on developing the algae biomass as a food health additive the ability of the algae to reduce cholesterol levels, serum cholesterol levels. We have performed a series of uh, in vivo experiments in the, in the red and some uh, experiments in humans which are demonstrating indeed that addition of the algae biomass to the diet of the animals or to humans uh, decreases the total cholesterol levels, decreases what we call the bad cholesterol, the low density lipoproteins levels, and does not affect the good cholesterol, the high density lipoprotein levels. On the same times, we have found that the algae also affect the, the reduction of triglycerides in the serum. In, a, in an, another uh, research concerning this topic, we found in, a, in some in vitro studies that the mode of action is indeed that the algae biomass binds cholesterol and bile acids in the gut and produce indigestible complexes that are removed from the body uh, as feces. Uh, we believe that, we, that this algae biomass might be used as a food else additive uh, to patients with, which are suffering from this lipide lipidemia. And as we know that diabetic patients, one of the main complications of these patients is this lipidemia. And we believe that this algae might be used in treating diabetic patients as well. 
recently uh, we have developed some uh, micro capsules from this uh, algae. I don't know if you can see it. And these micro capsules were used in our uh, human uh, experiments. This, these capsules are added to, um, to milk or to orange juice or to um, some uh, milk products. And uh, we found that it is, as one of the, the volunteers that use these micro capsules, I can say that uh, it's useful. I mean, we can use it. I do believe that this university provides a unique setup for a real interdisciplinary study of diabetes because it has both basic research, it has community-based research, it has research into social and psychological aspects of diabetes and it has many groups working together with one aim and one basic goal. I would like very much to send my appreciation to the Greenhill family and particularly to Mr. High Greenhill who is a, a great friend who understood exactly what the key problem is in patient education, who taught me how to look at the problem from the patient's point of view and not the clinician's point of view, and who was very, very uh, helpful in counseling when we had some questions about how would you like to see things going on. Um, I would like to extend that to his family even though I didn't know his uh, children and grandchildren um, and even though I haven't seen him for many years uh, we never forget and I personally will never forget the immense help and the uh, a friendship that we build up together and uh, I hope that we will continue to do that. Thank you.